Hello everyone. I hope you don't mind the rain noises. I really love this this uh, side of the Bangladeshi monsoon um, with the, the the calm part of the storms really in the monsoon time with slight thunder here and there and the downpour. It's just absolutely beautiful. So I thought I'd read over the sound of this weather. Since I really enjoy it, I'd hope you do too. But anyways, um, since I've started, let's just go with it. Let's uh, read from the chapter, Stop Kills a Whale. Oh, right. Yes, that's where we left off. And um, yeah, let's begin. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Stub kills a whale. If to Starbuck the apparition of the squid was a thing of portents, to Quickwig it was quite a different object. When you see him, quid, said the savage, honing his harpoon in the bow of his hoisted boat, then you quick see him, parm well. The next day was exceedingly still and sultry, and with nothing special to engage them, the Picaud's crew could hardly resist the spell of sleep induced by such a vacant sea. For this part of the Indian Ocean, through which we then were voyaging, is not what whalemen call a lively ground. That is, it affords fewer glimpses of porpoises, dolphins, flying fish, and other vivacious denizens of more stirring waters than those of the Rio de la Plata, or the inshore ground of Peru. It was my turn to stand at the foremast head, and with my shoulders leaning against the slackened royal shrouds to and fro, I idly swayed in what seemed an enchanted air. No resolution could withstand it, in that dreamy mood, losing all consciousness. At last my soul went out of my body. Though my body still continued to sway as a pendulum will, long after the power which first moved it is withdrawn. Ere forgetfulness altogether came over me, I had noticed that the seamen at the main and mizzen mastheads were already drowsy so that at last all three of us lifelessly swung from the spars, and for every swing that we made there was a nod from below from the slumbering hillsmen. The waves, too, nodded their indolent crests, and across the wide trance of the sea, east nodded to west, and the sun over all. Suddenly bubbles seemed bursting beneath my closed eyes, like vices, my hands grasped the shrouds. Some invisible, gracious agency preserved me. With a shock, I came back to life. And lo, close under our lee, not forty fathoms off, a gigantic sperm whale lay rolling in the water like the capsized hull of a frigate. His broad, glossy back of an Ethiopian hue glistened in the sun's rays like a mirror, but lazily undulating in the trough of the sea, and ever and anon, tranquilly spouting his vapory jet, the whale looked like a portly burger smoking his pipe of a warm afternoon. But that pipe, poor whale, was thy last. As if struck by some enchantress wand, the sleepy ship, and every sleeper in it all at once started into wakefulness, and more than a score of voices from all parts of the vessel, simultaneously, with the three notes from aloft, shouted forth the accustomed cry, as the great fish slowly and regularly spouted the sparkling brine into the air. Clear away the boats, laugh! cried Ahab, and... Obeying his own order, he dashed the helm down before the helmsman could handle the spokes. The sudden exclamations of the crew must have alarmed the whale, and, ere the boats were down, majestically turning, he swam away to the leeward. But with such a steady tranquility and making so few ripples as he swam that 
Thinking after all he might not as yet be alarmed, Ahab gave orders that not an oar should be used, and no man must speak but in whispers, so seated like Ontario Indians on the gunwales of the boats. We swiftly but silently paddled along, the calm not admitting to the noiseless sails being set. Presently, as we thus glided in chase, the monster perpendicularly flitted his tail forty feet into the air and then sunk out of sight like a tower swallowed up. There go flukes, was the cry, an announcement immediately followed by Stubbs producing his match and igniting his pipe for now a respite was granted. After the full interval of his sounding had elapsed, the whale rose again, and being now in advance of the smoker's boat, and much nearer to it than to any of the others, Stubb counted upon the honor of the capture. It was obvious now that the whale had at length become aware of his pursuers. All silence of cautiousness was therefore no longer of use. Paddles were dropped and oars came loudly into play, and still puffing at his pipe, Stubb cheered on his crew to the assault. Yes, a mighty change had come over the fish. All alive to his jeopardy, he was going head out and part obliquely projecting from the mad yeast which he brewed. Start her, start her, my men. Don't hurry yourselves. Take plenty of time, but start her. Start her like thunderclaps, that's all, cried Stubb, spluttering out the smoke as he spoke. Start her now. Give him the long and strong stroke, that's the goal. Start her, Thash, my boy, start her all. But keep cool, keep cool. Cucumber, says the word. Easy. Easy, easy, only start her like grim death and grinning devils and raise the buried dead perpendicular out of the graves. Boys, that's all. Start her. Woohoo! Wahee! screamed the gay header in reply, raising some old war whoop to the skies, as every oarsman in the strained boat involuntarily bounced forward with the one tremendous leading stroke which the eager Indian gave. But his wild screams were answered by others quite as wild. Kee-hee, kee-hee, yelled Dagu, straining forwards and backwards in his seat, like a pacing tiger in his cage. Kala Kalu, howled quickly <laughs> as if smacking his lips over a mouthful of grenadier ste steak. And thus with oars and yells, the keels cut the sea. Meanwhile, Stubb, restraining his place in the van, still encouraged his men to the onset, while the, all the while puffing the smoke from his mouth. Like desperados, they tagged and they strained, till the welcome cry was heard. Stand up, Tastego! Give it to him! The harpoon was hurled, stern all. The oarsmen backed water, the same moment something went hot and hissing along every one of their wrists. It was the magical line. An instant before, Stubb had swiftly caught two additional turns with it round the loggerhead, whence, by reason of its increased rapid circlings, a hempen blue smoke now jetted up and mingled with the steady fumes from his pipe. As the line passed round and round the loggerhead, so also just before reaching that point, it blisteringly passed through and through both of Stubb's hands, from which the hand cloths of squares of quilted canvas sometimes worn at these times had accidentally dropped. It was like holding an enemy's sharp two-edged sword by the blade, and that enemy all the time striving to wrest it out of your clutch. Wed the line, wed the line, cried Stubb to the tub oarsman him seated by the tub, who, snatching off his hat, dashed the seawater into it. More turns were taken, so that the line began holding its place. The boat now flew through the boiling water like a shark all fins. Stubb and Tastego here changed places, stem for stern, 
A staggering business truly in that rocking commotion. From the vibrating line extending the entire length of the upper part of the boat and from its now being more tight than a harp string you would have thought the craft had two keels one cleaving the water the other the air as the boat churned on through both opposing elements at once a continual cascade played at the bows a caseless whirling eddy in her wake and at the slightest motion from within even but for a little finger the vibrating cracking craft canted over her spasmodic gunwale into the sea. Thus they rushed, each man with might and main clinging to his seat, to prevent being tossed to the foam, and the tall form of Tastego at the steering oar crouching almost double in order to bring down his center of gravity. Whole Atlantics and Pacifics seemed past as they shot on their way till at length the whale somewhat slackened his flight. Haul in, haul in, cried Stubb to the bowsman, and facing around towards the whale, all hands being pulled the boat up to him, while yet the boat was being towed on. Soon ranging up by his flank, Stubb, firmly planting his knee in the clumsy cleat, darted dart after dart into the flying fish. At the word of command, the boat alternately turning out of the way of the whale's horrible wallow, and then ranging up from another fling. Oh yes. <laughs> the red tide now poured from all sides of the monster like brooks down a hill. His tormented body rolled not in brine but in blood, which bubbled and seethed from furlongs behind in their wake. The slanting sun played upon this crimson pond in the sea, sent back its reflection into every face so that they all glowed to each other like red men. And all the while, jet after jet of white smoke was agonizingly shot from the spiracal of the whale, the vehement puff after puff from the mouth of the excited headsman, as at every dart hauling in upon the crooked lance by the line attached to it, Stubb straightened it again and again, by a few rapid blows against the gunwale, then again and again sent it into the whale. Pull up! Pull up! He now cried to the bowsman, as the waning whale relaxed in his wrath. Pull up! Close to! And the boat ranged along the fish's flank. When reaching far over the bow, Stubb slowly churned his long sharp lance into the fish, and kept it there carefully churning and churning as if cautiously seeking to feel after some gold watch that the whale might have swallowed, and which he was fearful of breaking, ere he could hook it out. But that gold watch he sought was the innermost life of the fish, and now it is struck, for starting from his trance into that unspeakable thing called his flurry, the monster horribly wallowed in his blood overwrapped himself in impenetrable, mad, boiling spray so that the imperiled craft, instantly dropping astern, had much ado, blinding to struggle out from that frenzied twilight into the clear air of the day. And now, abating in his flurry, the whale once more rolled out into view, surging from side to side spasmodically dilating and contracting his spout hole with sharp, cracking, agonized respirations. At last, gush after gush of clotted red gore, as if it had been the purpleless of wa red wine, shot into the frighted air, and, falling back again, ran dripping down his motionless flanks into the sea. His heart had burst. He's dead, Mr. Stubb! said Dagu. Yes, boats by smoked out. And, withdrawing his own from his mouth, Stubb scattered the dead ashes over the water, and, for a moment, stood thoughtfully eyeing the vast corpse he had made. The Dart A word concerning an incident in the last chapter. 
According to the invariable usage of the fishery, the whale boat pushes off from the ship. With the headsman or whale killer as temporary steersman and the harpooner or whale fastener pulling the foremost oar, the one known as the harpooner oar. Now it needs a strong nervous arm to strike the first iron into the fish, for often in what is called a long dart, the heavy implement has to be flung to the distance of 20 or 30 feet. But however prolonged and exhausting the chase, the harpooner is expected to pull his oar meanwhile to the uttermost. Indeed, he is expected to set an example of superhuman activity to the rest, not only by incredible rowing, but by repeated loud and intrepid exclamations. And what it is to keep shouting at the top of one's compass, while all the other muscles are strained and have started, what that is, none know, but those who have tried it. For once I cannot bawl very heartily and work very recklessly at one and the same time. In this straining, bawling state, then, with his back to the fish, all at once the exhausted harpooner hears the exciting cry, Stand by and give it to him. He now has to drop and secure his oar, turn around on his center halfway, seize the harpoon from the crotch, and with what little strength may remain, he essays to pitch it somehow into the whale. No wonder, taking the whole fleet of whalemen in a body, that out of fifty fair chances for a dart, not five are successful. No wonder that so many hapless harpooners are madly cursed and diserated. No wonder that some of them actually burst their blood vessels in the boat. No wonder that some sperm whalemen are absent four years with four barrels. No wonder that to many ship owners whaling is but a losing concern, for it is the harpooner that makes the voyage, and if you take the breath out of his body, how can you expect to find it there when most wanted? Again, if the dart be successful, then at the second critical instant, that is, when the whale starts to run, the boat header and harpooner likewise start to r start to running fore and aft to the imminent jeopardy of themselves and everyone else. It is then they change places, and the headsman, the chief officer of the little craft, takes his proper station in the bows of the boat. Now, I care not who maintains the contrary, but all this is both foolish and unnecessary. The headsman should stay in the bows from first to last, and should both dart the harpoon and the lance, and no rowing whatever should be expected of him, except under circumstances obvious to any fisherman. I know that this would sometimes involve a slight loss of speed in the chase, but long experience in various whalemen of more than one nation has convinced me that in the vast majority of failures in the fishery, it has not by any means been so much the speed of the whale as the before described exhaustion of the harpooner that has caused them. To ensure the greatest efficiency in the dart, the harpooners of this world must start to their feet from out of their idleness, and not from out of toil. The Crotch Out of the trunk the branches grow, out of them the twigs, so in productive subjects grow the chapters. The crotch alluded to on a previous page deserves independent mention. It is a notched stick of peculiar form, some two feet in length, which is perpendicularly inserted into the starboard gunwale near the bow, for the purpose of furnishing a rest of the wooden extremity of the harpoon, whose other naked barbed end sloppingly projects from the prow. Thereby the weapon is instantly at hand to its hurler, who snatches it up as ready from its rest as a black woodsman swings his rifle from the wall. It is customary to have two harpoons reposing in the crotch, respectively called the first and second irons. 
But these two harpoons, each by its own cord, are both connected with the line. The object being this, to dart them both, if possible, one instantly after the other, into the same whale. So that if, in the coming drag, one should draw out, the other may still remain a hold. It is a doubling of the chances. But it very often happens that, owing to the instantaneous, violent, convulsive running of the whale upon receiving the first iron, it becomes impossible for the harpooner, however lightning-like in his movements, to pitch the second iron to, into him. Nevertheless, as the second iron is already connected with the line, and the line is running, hence that weapon must, at all events, be anticipatingly tossed out of the boat. Somehow and somewhere else the most terrible jeopardy would involve all hands. Tumbled into the water, it accordingly is in such cases the spare coils of box line mentioned in a preceding chapter, making this feat in most instances prudently practicable. But this critical act is not always unattended with the saddest and most fatal casualties. Furthermore, you must know that when the second iron is thrown overboard, it thenceforth becomes a dangling sharp-edged terror, skittishly curveting about both boat and whale, entangling the lines, or cutting them, and making a prodigious sensation in all directions. Nor in general is it possible to secure it again until the whale is fairly captured and a corpse. Consider now how it must be in the case of four boats, all engaging one unusually strong, active and knowing whale. When owing to these qualities in him, as well as the thousand concurring accidents of such an audacious enterprise, eight or ten loose second irons may be simultaneously dangling about him. For, of course, each boat is supplied with several harpoons to bend on the line should to bend onto the line should the first one be ineffectually darted without recovery. All these particulars are faithfully narrated here, as they will not fail to elucidate several most important, however intricate passages in scenes hereafter to be painted. Stubb's Supper Stubbs' whale had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm, so forming a tandem of three boats, we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Vicode. And now, as we, eighteen men with our thirty-six arms and one hundred and eighty thumbs and fingers, slowly toiled hour after hour upon the in that inert sluggish corpse in the sea, and it seemed hardly to bulge at all, except at long intervals. Good evidence was hereby furnished of the enormousness of the mass we moved. For upon the great canal of Hangho, or whatever they call it in China, four or five laborers on the footpath will draw a bulky, frightened junk at the rate of a mile an hour. But this grand argosy we towed heavily forged along, as if laden with pig lead in bulk. Darkness came on, but three lights up and down in the Picquod's main rigging dimly guided our way. Till, drawing nearer, we saw Ahab dropping one of several more lanterns over the bulwarks. Vacantly eyeing the heaving whale for a moment, he issued the usual orders of securing it for the night, and then handing his lantern to a seaman, went his way into the cabin, and did not come forward again until morning. Though in overseeing the pursuit of the whale, Captain Ahab had evinced his customary activity, to call it so, yet now that the creature was dead, some vague dissatisfaction on, or impatience or despair seemed working in him as if the sight of the dead body reminded him that Moby Dick was yet to be slain. And though a thousand other whales were brought to his ship, all that would not one jot advance his grand monomaniac object. Very soon 
you would have thought from the sound on the Pequod's decks that all hands were preparing to cast anchor in the deep, for heavy chains are being dragged along the deck and thrust rattling out of the portholes. But by those clanking links, the vast corpse itself, not the ship, is to be moored. Tied by the head to the stern and by the tail to the bows, the whale now lies with its black hull close to the vessels, and seen through the darkness of the night, which obscured the sparse and rigging aloft, the two ship, the two ship and whale, seemed yoked together like colossal bullocks, whereof one reclines while the other remains standing. If Moody Ahab was now all quincents, at least so far as could be known on deck, Stubb, his second mate, flushed with conquest, betrayed an unusual but still good-natured excitement. Such an unwanted bustle was he in that the staid Starbuck, his official superior, quietly resigned to him for the time the sole management of affairs. One small helping, cause of all this liveliness in Stubb, was soon made strangely manifest. Stubb, was a high liver. He was somewhat intemperately fond of the whale as a flavorish thing to his palate. A steak, a steak ere I sleep. You, Dagu, overboard you go and cut me one from his maul. Here be it known that though these wild fishermen do not as a general thing, and according to the great military maxim make the enemy defray the current expenses of the war, at least before realizing the proceeds of the voyage. Yet now and then you find some of these Nantucketers who have a genuine relish for that particular part of the sperm whale, designated by Stubb, compromising the tapering extremity of the body. About midnight that steak was cut and cooked, and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil. Stubb stoutly stood up to his parmacity supper at the capstan head, as if that capstan were a sideboard. Nor was Stubb the only banqueter on whale's flesh that night. Mingling their mumblings with his own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks, swarming around the dead leviathan, smackingly feasted on its fatness. The few sleepers below in their bunks were often startled by the sharp slapping of their tails against the hull, within a few inches of the sleepers' hearts. Peering over the side you could... Oh no, the dogs will be really loud today. Oh my god, no. Oh no. Oh, I, di I did not think this through. Oh... Peering over the side, you could just see them, as before you heard them, wallowing in the sullen black waters and turning over on their backs as they scooped out huge globular pieces of the whale of the bigness of a human head. This particular feat of the shark seems all but miraculous. How, at such an apparently unassailable surface, they contrive to gouge out such symmetrical mouthfuls, remains a part of the universal problem of all things. The mark they thus leave on the whale may best be likened to the hollow made by a carpenter in counter countersinking for a screw. Though amid all the smoking horror and diabolism of a sea fight, sharks will be seen longingly gazing up to the ship's decks like hungry dogs around a table where red meat is being carved ready to bolt down every killed man that is tossed to them. And though while the valiant butchers over the deck table are thus cannibally carving each other's live meat with carving knives all gilded and tasseled, the sharks also, with their jewel-hilted mouths, are quarrelsomely carving away under the table at the dead meat. And though were you to turn the whole affair upside down, it would still be pretty much the same thing, that is to say, a shocking sharkish business enough for all parties, 
and those sharks also are invariable outriders of all slave ships crossing the Atlantic, systematically trotting alongside to be handy in case a parcel is to be carried anywhere, or a dead slave to be decently buried. And though one or two other like instances might be set down, touching the set terms, places and occasions, when sharks do most socially congregate and most hilariously feast, yet is there no conceivable time or occasion when you will find them in such countless numbers and in gayer or more jovial spirits than around a dead sperm whale, moored by night to a whale ship at sea. If you have never seen that sight, then suspend your decision about the propriety of devil worship and the exp expediency of conciliating the devil. Con conciliating the devil, all right, okay. But as yet, Stubb heeded not the mumblings of the banquet that was going on so nigh him. No more than the sharks heeded the smacking of his own epicurean lips. Cook, cook, where's that old fleece? He cried at length, widening his legs still further as if to form a more secure base for his supper. Yeah. And at the same time, darting his frock into the dish, as if stabbing with his lance. Cook, you cook, sail this way, cook. The old black, not in any very high glee at having been previously roused from his warm hammock at a most unseasonable hour came shambling along from the galley, for like many old blacks, there was something the matter with his knee pants, which he did not keep well scoured like his other pants. This old fleece, as they called him, came shuffling and limping along, assisting his step with his tongues, which after a clumsy fashion were made of straightened iron hoops. This old ebony floundered along, and in obedience to the world of command came to a dead stop on the opposite side of Stop's sideboard, when, the, when with both hands folded before him and resting on his two-legged cane, he bowed his arched back still farther over, at the same time sideways inclining his head so as to bring his best ear into play. Cook, said Stubb, rapidly lifting a rather reddish morsel to his mouth. Don't you think the steak is rather overdone? You've been beating the steak too much, Cook. It's too tender. Don't I always say that to be good a whale steak must be tough? There are those sharks now over the side, don't you see? They prefer it tough and rare. What a shindy they are kicking up. Cook, go and talk to him. Tell him they are welcome to help themselves civilly and in moderation. But they must keep quiet. Blast me. If I can hear my own voice. Away, cook, and deliver my message. Here, take this lantern. Snatching one from his sideboard. Now then, go and preach to him. Sullenly taking the offered lantern, old fleece limped across the deck to the bulwarks. And then, with one hand dropping his light low over the sea so as to get a good view of his congregation, with the other hand he solemnly flourished his tongues, and leaning far over the side in a mumbling voice began addressing the sharks, while Stubb, softly crawling behind, overhearing all that was said. Fellow critters, I was ordered here to say that you must stop that damn noise there, you hear? Stop that damn smacking up a lip. Massa Stubb say that you can fill your damn bellies up to the hatchings. But by gore, you must stop the damn racket. Cook, here interposed Stubb, accompanying the word with a sudden slap of the shoulder. Cook, why damn your eyes, you mustn't swear that way when you're preaching. That no way to convert sinners, cook. Who that? Then preach to him yourself. Sullenly, turning to go. 
No, Cook, go on, go on. Well then, beloved fellow critters. Right, exclaimed Stubb approvingly. Coax them to it, try that. And Fleece continued. Do you as all sharks, and by nature very voracious. Yet I say to you, fellow critters, that that voracious top that damn slapping up the tail. How you think to hear? Suppose you keep up such a damn slapping and biting there. Look, cried Stubb, collaring him. I won't have that swearing. Talk to him gentlemanly. Once more the sermon proceeded. Your voraciousness, fellow critters, I don't blame you so much for. That is nature, and can't be helped. But to go burn that wicked nature, that is the pint. You is sharks, tartin. But if you go burn the shark in you, why then you be angel? For all angel is nothing more than the shark well go burned. Now look here, brethren. Just try once to be civil, a helping yourselves from that whale. Don't be tearing the blubber out your neighbor's mouth. I say, is not one shark do the right as totter that whale? And by gore, none of you has the right to that whale. That whale belonged to someone else. I know some of you, some of you, has very big mouth, bigger than others. But then, they big mounts sometimes has the small bellies. So that they brig, brigands, brigness of the mouth is not to sweller with, but to bite off the blubber for the small fry of sharks that can't get into the scars to help themselves. Well done, old fleas, cried Stubb. That's Christianity. Go on. No use going on. They damn villains will keep us crouching and slapping each other, Master Stubb. They don't, they don't hear one word. No use of preaching to such damn guttons, as you call them, till their bellies is full and their bellies is bottomless. And when they do get them full, they, they won't hear you then. For they, then they sink to the sea, go fast to sleep on the coral, and can hear nothing at all, no more for ever and ever. Upon my soul, I am about of the same opinion, so give the benediction, fleece, and I'll away to my supper. Upon this, fleece holding both hands over the fishy mob, raised his shrill voice and cried, Cast fellow critters, kick up the damnest, the damnedest row as ever you can. Fill your damn bellies till they burst, and then die. Now, cook," said Stubb, resuming his supper at the capstan. Stand, stand just where you stood before. There, over against me, and pay particular attention. All attention said Fleece, again stooping over upon his tongues in the desired position. Well, said Stubb, helping himself freely meanwhile, I shall now go back to the subject of this steak. In the first place, how old are you, cook? What did you do with this steak? said the old black testily. Silence! How old are you, cook? About ninety, they say. He gloomily muttered. And have you lived in this world hard upon one hundred years, cook, and don't know yet how to cook a whale steak? Rapidly bolding another mouthful at the last word so that the morsel seemed a continuation of the question. Where are you born, cook? In the hatchway in ferry boat going over the Ranokoi. Born in a ferry boat? That's queer too. But I want to know what country you were born in, Cook. Didn't I say the Ranakoi country? 
he cried sharply. No, you didn't cook. But I'll tell you what I'm coming to, cook. You must go home and be born over again. You don't know how to cook a whale steak yet. Bresh my soul if I could cook not one. He growled. He growled angrily, turning round to depart. Come back, cook. Here, hand me those tongues. Now, take that bit of steak there and tell me if you think that steak cooked as it should be. Take it, I say holding the tongs towards him. Take it and taste it. Faintly smacking his withered lips over it for a moment, the old negro muttered, Best cooked steak I ever taste. Juicy, very juicy. Cook, said Stubb, squaring himself once more. Do you belong to the church? Passed one once in the Cape Town said the old man sullenly. And you once in your life passed a holy church in Cape Town where you doubtless overheard a holy person addressing his hearers in his beloved fellow creatures. Have you, cook? As his beloved fellow creatures, have you, cook? And yet you come here and tell me such a dreadful lie as you did as just now, eh? said Stubb. Where do you expect to go, cook? Go to bed very soon, he mumbled, half turning as he spoke. Avast, heave to. I mean, when you die, cook, it's an awful question. Now, what's your answer? Ah, sure, Macaulay. It's fine. When this old black man dies, said the negro slowly, changing his whole air and demeanor. He himself won't go nowhere, but some blessed angel will come and fetch him. Oh, baby. Stay here, please. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Fetch him? How? In a coach and four as they fetch Elijah? And fetch him where? <laughs> Up there, said Fleece, holding his tongue straight over his head and keeping it there very solemnly. So then, you expect to go up into your our main top, do you, cook, when you are dead? But don't you know the higher you climb, the colder it gets? Main top, eh? Didn't say that at all, said Fleece, again in the sulks. You said up there, didn't you? And now look yourself and see where your tongues are pointing. But perhaps you're, you expect to get into heaven by crawling through the lubber's hole, cook. But no, no, cook, you don't get there except you go, to the, go the regular way, round by the rigging. It's a ticklish business, but must be done, or else it's no go. But none of us are in heaven yet. Drop your tongues, cook, and hear my orders. Do you hear? Hold your head in one hand and clap it together atop your heart. When I'm giving my orders, cook. What? That you hear there. That's your gizzard? Aloft, aloft. That's it. Now you have it. Hold it there now and pay attention. All dinchen, said the old black with both hands placed as desired vainly wriggling his grizzled head as if to get both ears in front at one and the same time. Well then, cook, you see this whale's take of yours was so very bad that I have put it out of sight as soon as possible. You see that, don't you? Well, for the future, when you cook another whale's take for my private table here, the capstan... I'll tell you what to do so as not to spoil it overdoing. Hold the steak in one hand and show a live coal to it with the other. That done dish it, do you hear? And now tomorrow, cook, when we are cutting in the fish, be sure you stand by to get the tips of his fins. Have them put in pickle. As for the ends of the flukes, have them soused, cook. There now, ye may go. 
but Fleece had hardly got three paces off when he was recalled. Cook, give me cutlets for supper tomorrow night in the midwatch. Do you hear? Away you sail then. Halloa, stop. Make a bow before you go. A vast heaving again. Whale balls for breakfast, don't forget. Wish by gore, whale eat him. Instead of him it whale. I'm breast if he ain't more of shark than massa shark himself. Muttered the old man, limping away, with which sage ejaculation he went to his hammock. What? A dash, dash, bleep, bleep, etc. That stub. Oh. Oh. Anyways, let me know, guys, if you like this um, more audible surrounding audio of my reading today. If you did, uh, whenever it rains or the the weather's a little um, tempestuous, tumultuous, I don't know. <laughs> whenever the weather's like this, I'll I'll open my windows and read like this it's it's somewhat more comfortable for me too because at least there's a little wind usually when i read read i have everything turned off i have my windows closed so it gets stuffy it gets very very stuffy but anyways let me know if you like this and now the dogs are out barking away and that is um my cue to say goodbye as I always do. Hadebra!